be a great, it's going to be a great Christmas season. Thanks for coming out. Who likes Christmas? Christmas presents. That of course the series title is the presence of Christmas, which is a little bit of a play on words for us. His presents are the best presents. His presence is the best of all presents. I don't know if you think back over your life when you got your most favorite Christmas present. I was probably right around eight or ten. My two most favorite Christmas presents of all time. First of all, it involved a microphone, believe it or not. Uh, that was a tape recorder back when we had cassettes. It's like, a, it's like an MP3, but not really. Uh, <laughs> a fast forward, rewind, pencil in the hole, and brown tape. So I got a tape recorder, which I just absolutely loved. Just recorded Christmas music on the radio that Christmas night. That was fun. And then I got my BB gun when I turned 10. I had to be 10 to get a BB gun. I don't know if that's the magical age or not. I'm sure Davina will get her when she, hers when she's five. Um, but I got a BB gun. I thought that was great. The worst present ever, just universally, would be underwear for all of us. Why? Just the parents an opportunity to get you something that you need anyway, you know. They say the magical number of presents for any child is three. Uh, psychologists, I did some, a lot of research on presents over the last month, if you believe it or not. The magical number is three. And the best reason I could find out was because the, is because the wise men brought a gift each, the gold, frankincense, and In fact, the Bible isn't, isn't clear that there were three wise men. We just know that there were three gifts. So maybe three or four were cheapskates, didn't bring anything, and there was seven. I don't know, but there was only three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, this is a, a, I just heard on the radio this morning that uh, cyber sales on Thanksgiving Day was up 14%, which is like some odd billions of dollars uh, online on Thanksgiving Day. La- Black Friday, didn't that start like last month? For some reason, Black Friday started like... Like October, it was crazy. And then, then I got emails this morning. Don't forget, Black Friday sales extended through next Thursday or Friday. I was like, I don't even understand. But I did some uh, some statistics last year. Retail sales in America, 2018, surpassed one trillion. Now I don't even know what that number means. I don't even can't get my mind around a trillion. That's a lot of billions. Um, Twenty-seven million real Christmas trees were sold last year. Real tree, anybody real tree in the house? Any real trees in the house? A few artificial trees, no trees. Aluminum foil trees from the 1970 with the colored lights underneath. Yeah, baby. 29% of you started your shopping in November for Christmas, but an amazing 62% of you do not buy a gift until the week before Christmas. Can you believe that? More than half of you wait to the last week. I don't get that. 2018, last year, U.S. US households on average spent $1,536 per household on Christmas. $1,536, yeah, yeah. I wish they knew me. (laughs) 14% of Americans actually sell their own possessions to buy Christmas presents. I've done that. It's not that bad. And this is my, I think this is the most weird. 51% of you, me, us, will actually, when we're out shopping for other people, will go, I think I'll get that for myself. 51% of us buy Christmas presents for ourselves. Why? Because we like presents. It's buy, 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 buy. It's, it's Black Friday, and then tomorrow, of course, is Cyber Monday, which will turn into Cyber Tuesday, and... I mean, we all love presents, but here's what Jesus said. He said, don't store up for yourself presents on earth. Don't store up for yourself treasures here on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Every, it's really quite sobering, but everything you spend all that money on will eventually break. It'll wear out or burn or get broken, maybe even Christmas night get broken. <laughs> but 
But we're all here today because we know the greatest present. That is his presence. And that's what this series is all about. God's presence is his presence. And so each of our sermons this month will start with the letter P. All right. So I have over here a present. Do what? Do I use a knife at home? Every male in my family possesses a knife on Christmas Eve to open presents. I'm just saying. And they carry the big twink, buck knives. I got the little, what is this? This is the, uh, it says it's a buck knife. This is an actual buck knife, but it's a little, they'll still take it from you at the airport, though. I don't care. I don't care how big it is. I have to turn it around here. Drum roll. Yes, yes. The P that we're going to speak, thank you, sir. The P we're going to speak about This morning is promise. So get out your Bibles, and uh, because there's 330 promises in the Old Testament of Jesus, and we're going to preach all of them. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) We're not going to preach all 330 promises in the Old Testament. Believe that. In the Old Testament, there's 330 promises of the coming of Jesus, and he fulfilled every one of them. And so we're just going to look at one of them, and that's going to be found in Isaiah chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, uh, get it out. And we're going to talk about the, the, the promise of his presence, the presence being the promise, in Isaiah 9, beginning at verse 6. For unto us a child is born. That's why today's sermon logo, I think, is a, actually... Can you put the sermon slide back up again, Rose? I think it's actually a, a manger, Yes. The promise is that he's coming. The promise is that the presence of heaven is going to be with us. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government, praise the Lord, was going to be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Just think about that for a second. Of the increase of his peace, it will never end. It'll just keep increasing. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom and established and upholding it with justice and righteousness. I'm glad there's both because there can be justice that is unrighteous. With justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. So the present we're going to address this morning is the promise. How is a promise a present? Well, if you've been married, then you understand what engagement means. That wasn't the real deal. That was a promise that was really great, really awesome. You celebrated, you took, fan, you took pictures, you to, told all your friends, you made this huge announcement about a non-event that hadn't happened. That's how important promises can be. And so the, the promise of heaven is that this morning, fourfold, he is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. We're gonna take a moment and talk about each of those. First of all, Wonderful counselor. I don't know if you've ever been to a counselor. I've been to a counselor. Paul Swanson, when I was about nine years old, he says, sure, you can jump off that roof. You're not going to break your leg. 
We all have counselors in our life. People that give us advice, some good, some not so good. In your childhood, maybe someone told you, oh, go ahead, you won't get caught. Was that a wonderful counselor? No. So you come out of, out of grade school, you come out of your childhood, you get into high school, and in 1975, your high school counselor said, why would you want to study computers? It's a fad. <laughs> your high school counselor. You get a little older, 20 years ago, you went to your financial counselor. He said, don't invest in Apple, it's going to go bust. Counselors everywhere. Marriage counselor, family counselor, substance abuse counselor, debt counselor, grief counselors, nutritional counselors, health and fitness counselors, anger management counselors. But with the birth of Jesus, we have the wonderful counselor. He's always going to give you the best advice. Every other counselor you've ever gone to or ever will go to is a broken human. If you want wisdom, you want counsel, go to the heavenly father. He is the wonderful counselor. Wonderful, meaning full of wonder. That's weird, because we use the word wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, that's wonderful. Like, that's pleasant, that's likable. No, that's nice. We say, that's wonderful. That's not the kind of wonderful that God says Jesus is going to be for us. He says, Wonderful in that this is a mind-boggling word. It means, in the original language, it means, of course, full of wonder, which is incomprehensible and miraculous. So what he's going to tell you when you go to him, I mean, you can go to your other counselors, but at the end of the day, run anything by, any advice anybody gives you, run that by the wonderful counselor. Early on, I... In ministry, I'm not a, I'm not a great counselor. I'll, I'll tell you what the word has to say, and then I say, you should probably do that, and then if you don't do that, then I don't have a whole lot of help for you. You need to go talk to somebody who's going to coddle you, because it's not going to be me, because I'm going to tell you what the word says. That's what you should do. So if that's what you're doing, stop that and do this. That's my counsel. People generally don't like that kind of counsel. They want you to, there, 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 it's okay, it's okay. They like that stuff, and I'm not that guy. And so, I, 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 so, you know, I would say, why would you come to me for counsel? You have at your disposal the wonderful counselor. Now, I'll talk with you, but if you want to come have a talk with me, make a two-hour appointment. The first hour, come into the church auditorium, come in the sanctuary, and I want you to pray for an hour. I want you to talk to the wonderful counselor before you talk to the human counselor. So after an hour with the wonderful counselor, you come in, you talk to me, and you tell me what God told you, and I'll go, that's a good idea. You should do that. That's how I counsel. Because why? I, I want the wonderful counselor, don't you? Because I've gotten some bad counsel. Don't, invi- don't, don't, don't learn computers. Don't invest. In, you're sure you can jump off the roof. No, you won't get caught. I, we've got counsel all around us, and the world's giving you all kind of counsel. It's screwy. Go into debt, be crazy, spend thousands of dollars on stuff you don't need. So I want the wonderful counselor, amen? Amen. When you're broken, go to the one who made you. I was working working in my basement. Now this is probably like uh, probably two years ago. And I had a, I had a, I had a razor knife, a box cutter, like a for real, real razor blade. And I couldn't cut this piece of plastic I couldn't cut this piece of plat. This edge of plastic was hanging off this edge, and I'm trying to cut it. And I so I, 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 I put this hand here to, to firm it up, and then I, and then when it slipped off ugh, like that, I, I have a Z for Zorro through the palm of my hand. I had a, this huge deep laceration through my hand, and I go, oh no, that's not good. I'm at home, home by myself, and it just begins to just gurgle blood. And, and I checked my fingers to make sure I didn't cut, a, cut anything that, that was, like, vital. And, but it was bleeding pretty good. So, like any male would do, you put a wash rag on it, because that's what you do. You know, you put a wash rag there. And pressure, I know that. And then elevate it. That would be a good thing. So what am I going to do like this? So I went upstairs, and I sat down at, on the couch, and I put, I put my hand on my head and watched television for an hour, like this. 
thinking that direct pressure would be enough. And with my other hand, I texted my wife, bring gauze home from work. To which she responds, what did you do? To which I responded, I cut my hand. So the hour, hour, a couple hours go by now. I hear the door down. She comes upstairs. She says, let me see it. So I open my hand like this, and we take the, the, the wash rag off. It's now blood-soaked. And it's been above my head now for two hours. I'm thinking, no, no problem. We've coagulated and everything. Like that, and it goes. <laughs> she says, get in the car. Just like that. I said, did you bring, get, get in the car. And so we got in the car. And, and I think it would really be strange if she would have driven me to an electrician. Why would she take me to an electrician? Why? That's because it's not electrical. This is not an electrical problem. This is a doctor problem. So we went to the hospital. We went to prompt care. If you break your leg, you go to the doctor. If you have a broken water pipe, you go to the plumber. If you have a broken watch, you go to the jeweler. If you have a broken car, you go to the mechanic. If you have a broken spirit, you go to the one who made you. You go to the one who made you. Some people are, this holiday, are hemorrhaging in their heart. They're super sad. Let me tell you where you can go to get it fixed. It says in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. What? A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you have yet to deny. When you bring your broken, lacerated, bleeding heart to God, he, that's a sacrifice to him. He loves it, and he wraps you up, and he fixes it. The surgeon, the doctor at prompt care goes, oh, yeah, we, got, we can fix that, and gave me a couple big old shots right in the hand, you know, and then just commenced to lacing it back up. He said, it was a miracle you didn't cut a tendon or anything like that. And so I had stitches in my hand, but now it's fine. Your heart can be healed. Your heart can be mended. He can give you, in fact, he says he'll take and give you a brand new heart. He's a wonderful counselor. He just not only gives you advice, he heals your heart. Number two, it's the promise of a mighty God. I don't know who your favorite superhero is. The Hulk, Captain America, Iron Man, Wolverine, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. Come on, girls. Spider-Man, Black Panther, Flash, Thor. My Three Ponies. <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Power Rangers. Let me tell you, Jeep. I got a hand on Power Rangers. Yes, I got a testimony on Power Rangers right back there. Thank you, brother. Jesus, listen, is every superhero together combined times infinity. He's a mighty God. Say mighty God. Psalm 95, 3, for the Lord God is the great God. He is the great king above all gods. Every other thing that it has any sense of source of power in your life, is dwarfed by who God is. The presence is the promise that he is a mighty God. Isaiah 59, 1, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, or his ear too dull to hear. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, Ephesians 3, according to his power that is at work within us. And one of my favorite verses of all time is in the Christmas story in Luke chapter 30, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 37. The angel of the Lord comes to Mary and says, okay, you're going to have a baby. She says, how can that be? How can that be? I'm a virgin. I have never been with a man. And he goes, well, don't worry about it. She goes, be it unto me as you have spoken, for nothing is impossible with God. Well, that's impossible should not be in your vocabulary. What do you believe in God for? For your home this year, for your family, for your business, for your finance, for your health, for your job, for your church, 
for your boss, for your home. Listen, nothing's impossible. Well, he's so lost, he's never going to get saved. You keep confessing that about your boss, that's not what's going to happen. This place I work, man, it is a hell hole. I hate my job. This is the word. What are you confessing? What are you speaking over your life? You have a mighty God. I had a horrible boss once before I became a pastor. I worked as a manager for a finance company. And he was horrible. He was horrible. His first name was Mike. Mike was an alcoholic. Mike was a terrible, terrible person. Mike, every other word was the F word in the office. It was a horrible, horrible environment to work in. But I didn't care. God had saved me, and I was going to live a life for Christ no matter where I was. I mean, I went to, back in the day when you had Christian bookstores where you could, where you could buy a Christian pencil for a dollar rather than 20 cents, because that's what the Christian bookstores end up selling Jesus pencils for. You know what I mean. That's why they're not in business today. But I, you know, I bought Jesus loves you pencils for the whole office, put them on everybody's desk in the office. I didn't care. What are they going to do? And he, he hated that. Mike hated that stuff. He, he, he was crazy. But I began to go in the office, this is hand to heaven, I go in the office every day before everybody else got there, and I'd walk around the office, and I'd lay my hands on every desk in that office, and I would pray, and I'd pray in the Holy Spirit, and I'd pray down the glory of God. I'd say, God, you're going to get glory in this office. You're going to be praised. You're going to be honored. You're going to get, Mike's going to give his life. This is what I pray. Just walk around each desk. It took about 10 minutes, not long. Pray for everybody in the office. Well, that sounds weird. No, I, I serve a mighty God. I didn't write, my, I didn't, I didn't write Mike off. I didn't write him off. He's so lost, he's so, and just talk bad about him all the time. I believe that God could save his soul. He saved you, didn't he? <laughs> and you were pretty, you were pretty nasty, weren't you? So Mike ended up uh, repossessing a car that was on collateral that shouldn't be repossessed. He ended up getting in trouble. Then he got on a, he got on a binge. He went into the hospital, uh, into detox, and a Christian friend, a mutual Christian friend of both of ours, went and visited him, and he gave his life to the Lord, and he got saved. And I didn't get a release from that job, as horrible as it was, until Mike got saved. The day that Mike got saved, I was driving home from work, and I said, okay, now what, God? What's my next assignment? It wasn't long after that that God called me into the ministry, and that's why I stand here today. Perhaps if I wasn't faithful to believe for Mike's salvation in my office, I wouldn't even be here today. I don't know. That's how mighty God is. Don't ever write anybody off. Every superhero you can think of wrapped up times infinity. That's who God is. No matter what you think, everybody else thinks about what you're believing for, they're human broken counselors. Go to the wonderful counselor who I'll guarantee you will say, you serve a mighty God. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, number three, everlasting father. Uh, This figure is uh, two years old. It's from the U.S. Census Bureau. It says, I'm quoting now, um, that it says, there is a father absence, the absentee crisis in America, 20 million, 19.7, 20 million children, that's more than one in four. So more than 25% of the children in America today live in a home where there is no father. That's a lot. Statistics show that the absentee father factor is at the heart of nearly every social ill facing America today. I have a, a chart. I don't know how legible it is, but you can maybe follow along with some of these things. If there's no father in the home, that home is four times, 400% more likely to be in poverty. Seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. If there's no father in the home, your daughter is 700% more likely to become pregnant more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to face uh, abuse and neglect, twice as 
greater risk for infant mortality, more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs, more likely to go to prison, two times more likely to suffer obesity, more likely to commit a crime, two times more likely to drop out of high school. Why? Because there's no dad in the house. These are not... These are not Christian statistics. These are the statistics from the Census Bureau. So this is just the reality of not having a dad in the house. If that's true in the natural, how much more true would it be in the spiritual realm? See, we need to see that we have a promise of a good, good father. That's why we sang that song this morning. He's a good, good father. Why? Because he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never abandon you. And if your, if your idea of who God is is filtered through the broken human dad that you had growing up, congratulations, we all have to face that. My dad was an alcoholic. So, so my, only, my only understanding of who God was when I got saved, if he's a if he's a heavenly father, maybe not so good. He's a so-so father, not a good, good father. So you got to work through that. Well, you should probably go to counseling then. I said you should probably go to counseling and work through that. He's a good, good father. A mighty God, an everlasting father, the prince of peace. Prince of Peace, I, I have so enjoyed last month with the series in Philippians, I had to bring us back to last week, Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do you realize that you cannot put a price tag on peace of mind? But the world constantly puts a price tag on peace of mind. In fact, if you've ever been involved in sales at all, at the end of the day, you'll realize that if you sell peace of mind, people will pay just about anything to have peace of mind. I want, I got to know that that router is never going to break. I got to know that those tires are going to last forever. I got to know that when I die, my funeral is paid for. Peace of mind. I got to have a security system so my family is safe. Peace of mind. Everything revolves around you being at peace in your heart, having peace of mind. Oh, you better go to the good mechanic. Because if you don't, the bad mechanic, you're going to be stuck on the... Don't you want peace of mind? You got a family, brother. Let me sell you this car. You want the, you want the BR549 version of the 27 million airbags, and you got to pay if you want peace of mind. But we have a real, a genuine, a lasting, genuine peace. A peace that passes all understanding. And you don't have to pay for it because Jesus bought that present for you. Ah. John 14, 27. I love this. I've read it at many of funerals, this promise. Peace, this is Jesus speaking, red letters, John 14, 27. Peace, I leave with you. And what does the next word say? Whose peace? Whose peace? He says, my peace. Now, let me tell you, had a, had, a, had a pretty decent week, but every once in a while the enemy comes in and tries to steal your peace. Remember we talked about this last week, right? So let me tell you, you don't want my peace. Because my peace, right? Your peace. I don't know if your peace has been just rock solid, you know, on upward trajectory all week last, no, maybe you had a couple things during Thanksgiving, you know, Family, travels, bad weather, whatever, things that get in and try to rob your peace. Something you might want to go to counseling for. (laughs) I know a wonderful counselor. He says, my peace. That's the kind of peace that hung on a cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Wow. Wow. 
That'd be, that'd be some rock solid party piece right there. That's the kind of piece I want. And he says, my peace I will give you. And I don't give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Because if the world, listen to me, hear me. If the world gives it to you, they can take it away. If the world doesn't give it, if God gives it to you, it can't be taken away. That's why Paul, beaten on the floor of a prison, was at peace. Why? Because he didn't have his peace. He had God's peace, the promise of his presence, which is peace. Can I get an amen? This is what we've got to have, not just during the holiday season, though that's when the enemy really likes to come in and monkey with some of you. Syrup. I mean, I, I listen to Christmas music. I listen to Christmas music. I put up the tree, listen to Christmas music this week, you know. And sometimes it just got, you know, the lights are down. I'm listening, watching the fire. Listen to Christmas. And some of it gets kind of like sappy. And I could get really melancholy. And, you know, think about the good old days. I just, Christmas, I, I don't know, it's because I'm old. I got new tear ducts since I became a grandfather. I don't know what happened to me. I'm a lot, I'm a lot softer, believe it or not, than I used to be. You know, but like I, I refuse to listen to uh, Christmas Shoes, that song about that mom dying and needing a pair of shoes. I'm like, if that comes on the radio, I just soon throw it through the window. I pick whatever's up playing it and just stomp on it. That song has no business being on, t- on the radio, especially at Christmas time. Let's sing a song about my dying mother and a little kid's got no money even to buy her a pair of shoes. Merry Christmas. <laughs> what the heck, man? Right? So the enemy comes in and he'll steal your peace with a simple Christmas song. Right? Wonderful counselor. Prince of peace. I want his peace. Amen? Not some, not some peace from the dollar store. Huh? It's going to break. Not some peace you buy at one of those Chinese websites. It takes a month to get to you. It's going to break. Right? Get the real deal. Get the genuine thing. I don't think there's a whole lot of ladies who want cubic zirconia. They would prefer the real thing, right? Ladies, you want the real thing. Why? Because you ever get locked in a phone booth, you want to be able to cut yourself out, right? (laughs) I don't know. The promise of his presence, the promise of his presence. He's the wonderful counselor. Mm -hmm. You got a problem, take it to him. He is the mighty God. Nothing is too difficult for him. Nothing is impossible for him. He's the everlasting father. And sometimes, I mean, I lost my father and the, my, my, my dad came to the Lord. Uh, our relationship was restored. The last couple of years of his life was awesome. I saw him right before he died. And, uh, but sometimes, you know, you just want, you want a hug. You want a hug from your dad. And you can't have it for whatever reason. Maybe you're just estranged and dad's still kind of a freak. Or maybe he's dead, or maybe he's not around. I'm talking about guys, too, and gals. Amen. You know what? You have a heavenly father, and he'll hug you, and he'll love you, and he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you (laughs) because he's an everlasting good, good father. And he's the prince of peace. I know we all want presence this year, but can we see that the presence that we really want is his presence? And you may want, you know, that special thing. You want that special toy. You've dropped all the hints, and you're hoping you might get it. If they don't get it, you're going to go buy it for yourself. 51% of you will probably just go buy it for yourself. But the best present is the present that doesn't wear out. Not under the tree, but hung on a tree for you. And his name is Jesus. Just stand with me this morning. Let's just bow our heads here for a moment and reflect upon the promise. Reflect upon the promise. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You need your dad today. You need that peace. You need God to show up in a powerful way. You're needing some advice and you just wish the dad could give it to you. He's here. I know he's here. And he's here to minister to you this morning. I'm going to open up the altars for you to just come down and and bend a knee and have some time with the Father this morning. If you need to just come to this altar, just step out. The person next to you will move. Just find a place. Just find a place to get alone with the Lord. The wonderful counselor. You need him to give you a piece of advice. You've been running around looking for an answer, and you forgot to just be quiet enough to be still and know there's some, something that's immovable in your life and you're needing the might of God to show up. This is that moment. He promises the breakthrough. His presence, His presence is the promise of an everlasting Father. A good, good Father. Who brings with Him supernatural peace and of the increase of that peace there will be no end for this child born this son given was given to you you may have some big questions about who God is that have never been answered and I'll quite be honest they may never be answered But this morning, as your heart is tender before the Lord, would you consider accepting his promise just like a a bride does on the evening of her engagement? The day hasn't come yet, but he's promised you. He never goes back on his word. Receive Jesus today. Just open the door of your heart. You may even say, God, I don't even totally understand, but I'm going to let you into my life today. I am broken and I've got nothing to offer you. But the Lord says, a broken and a contrite spirit I have yet to deny. Your broken spirit is actually an offering to me. And I'll bring you peace. I'll bring you the counsel. In the name of Jesus. We lift our hearts to you now and say, Father, minister your word and your presence into my life. Become more real to me today. The Lord is speaking to you. He may speak to you in your dreams tonight. He did me last evening. He may speak to you in something that you see this afternoon, in a word that someone gives you. He's everywhere, and he's ministering to you right now. May the peace of God that passes understanding guard your heart this Christmas season and keep you in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.